So tonight I just went over the information that I was providing about your SCORE mentor and, and all of those logistics. So next we're going to have Bill Davis is gonna provide some content for us tonight about the business plan and then Dr. Angie Arrington. And then we'll probably have some time to stop and talk and go over some additional things with the group because you all may have questions about what we're gonna do going forward. Beautiful, beautiful group tonight. You all look wonderful. It's so good to see you all. All right, Bill, you are, you're in. Uh, one, I'm Bill Davis, as Patty said. I'm gonna be focusing on two things tonight. Uh, knowing, your, knowing your market and knowing your business environment. And really this is about the market research that you want to do in developing your business plan. Now, I'm going to focus on two things in that in terms of research. I'm going to talk about your target market, uh, which deals with your market. And then I'm going to spend some time on a SWOT analysis, which really, from my perspective, is about your business environment. So let's talk a little bit about target market. And the first question is, what is your target market? Uh, we're gonna work through that. What are your target markets buying and shopping habits? What is your target market's willingness to pay? And what and who is your competition? But let me go back to the, to the first one, which is what is your target market? That's where you are going, that's who you want to do business with. That's where you want to be able to focus your resources, your marketing, your efforts. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. In doing that, you want to learn what the buying and shopping habits are of the individuals or the businesses in that, in that target market. You also want to know or figure out what they will pay for what it is, your, your product or service that you're offering. We call that willingness to pay. And that really is dependent upon their perception of the value that they, that's delivered to them through your product or service. And then the other thing to be successful is it's, a, it's critical and important to understand what your competition is and who your competition is so that you can position yourself effectively relative to them. And who else the people in your target market are looking to, to provide value similar to the value that you're providing. So this is the way I look at it. The, the target market, again, is who you want to do business with. Prospects are those individuals or businesses that are engaged in considering whether to do business with you or not. And then your customers or clients are obviously the people that you are actually uh, delivering a product or service to. A, a couple of things. Oftentimes, small business owners, when they're getting started, focus only on their customers. Uh, what that doesn't do is provide them uh, a sufficient opportun um, amount of opportunity, nor does it necessarily give them insight into who to focus on to get to them to be a customer. Now, everything else outside of your target market, I refer to as the, as the mass market. Um, and when you develop your target market or figure out what your target market is, one of the benefits of that is that reduces the number of other businesses that you compete against, which is always a benefit and an advantage. So why is target market so important? And, and I will tell you in my years of working with businesses, um, my experience is it really is one of the most critical things to figure out and keep working on until you get it right. Now, here's why it's so important. Number one, your business, no matter how successful it is, is gonna have limited resources. 
in terms of you and your staff's time, in terms of your marketing budget is limited, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to be able to focus those limited resources where they can make the biggest impact, where they can make the difference. So you don't want to be expending resources on businesses or individuals that are not in your target market, okay? Um, because that will dilute the impact that you could have. The second reason the target market is so important is that providing value is directly related to knowing the needs of your market. So if I had a pet, let's say, uh, and you were selling dog collars, then a dog collar has some value to me because I have a pet. But if I didn't have a pet, that same dog collar, no matter how good it is, no matter how effective it is, no matter how it's priced, would provide no value to me. So value is always related to the needs of your target market. Okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> you want to think through what is your target market? The biggest two divisions is one, do you do business, do you want to do business with businesses or do you want to do business with consumers or individuals? If it's businesses, you want to think through <clears throat> for the product or services you're offering, what type of businesses do you want to do business with? And even inside of that, what size businesses do you want to do business with? So for example, let's say I'm a consultant or I have a consulting business. It would be valuable for me to understand whether I wanted to consult businesses that um, had just sole proprietors or whether they had employees, whether they were businesses that provided services or whether they were businesses that provided products, and then what size business they are, because their needs will vary by type of business and by size of business. Businesses have very distinct characteristics and needs based on, on those two things. And then if your market is is consumers or individuals, you want to think through what, what generation or generations do I, do I really want to do business with or what group? Uh, because doing business with baby boomers is different than doing business with Gen Xers, is bit different than doing business with millennials. Uh, same thing, what gender is your target market? Married individuals or singled individuals? homeowners or, or renters, you want to think through those things. The one thing <clears throat> that gets in the way of any being, business being successful is when they think that everybody is in their marketplace. One, there's not that much resource, and two, the characteristics and needs and what produces value it's, it would be hard or impossible to really zero in on that. One of the concerns that business owners often have initially when they're thinking about target markets is there's a concern about excluding people that they would possibly do business with. Um, and I will tell you that the most successful businesses are the businesses that do the best job at targeting because markets tend to be very deep. And I'll demonstrate that um, in the next couple of, um, couple of points. So let's say that you have defined your market, your target market. Then the next thing really is to identify who's in that market. You know, because if you don't know who's in that market, you don't know who to focus 
your marketing efforts, your messaging, your sales efforts towards. So one of the things that I've discovered, a very useful and practical tool is uh, the Wake County Library. And I'm gonna step you through um, this information because I think you, you can find it very useful. You'll notice I have a link up here, wakegov.com slash libraries. Uh, I encourage each of you all to write that down. If you go to that uh, URL, you'll see the page that's on the screen and under resources, you'll notice the fourth item down says library databases. Well, one of the things that, that libraries do is provide members of the library or people that have library card access, access to a, a very wide array of ver databases that have all kinds of information. But if you click on that uh, and then go down the alphabetical list to something called Reference USA Databases, you will see I've got circled that one of the Reference US databases is all of the US, all of the businesses in the United States. Uh, there is also, as you can see, if you go to the column to the right and down to the fourth item, a US consumers and lifestyle database. So whether your biz, your market is businesses or consumers, there is a source of information, a, a, a data source that can help you identify who is that. And I will tell you, once you can really see who those businesses are or who those individuals are, it makes it much easier to get an understanding of what their needs are, their buying habits, et cetera. So let me continue through. If you clicked on where it says search more information, you'd get a screen that looks something like this. And so um, let's say that I'm a consulting business again and that I want to do business with companies located, privately held companies located in the Raleigh Cary area that have sales revenues of between one and $50 million. Now I have selected those and you, if you look to where it's circled, you'll see the record count says that there are 12,803 businesses doing that are privately owned doing between one and $50 million in the Raleigh Cary area. If I were to hit that little green uh, button, then all 12,000 of those businesses would be listed. And so I would actually know the name of those, those businesses and the database will even provide further who's the owner of that business, the street address, the phone number, the website, the number of employees, a, a whole range of data that would allow me to then have a much greater understanding of who's in my target market and, and things about those businesses in my target market. If you look to the right of that, there is a selection screen from the consumer database. Um, and this is set up to select, uh, let me look and make sure, in the raleigh Cary area, uh, the number of households that have people between the age of 25 and 29 that are single and female. And that's 31,349. So if I was trying to decide or work on what size business I was going to have, this would tell me the potential number of customers or potential number of prospects in my target market, which would be really important, I think you can see, for you to be able to determine the, the potential size of your market, how much market share you might be um, in, in pursuit of, and what the potential revenues of your 
of your business business could be. So that's how you go from defining your target market to actually identifying and sizing your, your target market. A very critical part of setting up and understanding your business and what you want to accomplish with it. So before I go on to talking about understanding your business environment, I want to stop and see what questions there are about target market before I go on. So there is a question in a chat uh, from uh, Wally uh, asking, <clears throat> you used to need a, a library card to access this information. Do you know if you still need to have that today? Uh, you do you do have to get a library card on the back of the library card um, there is a library member number I believe it is and you would have also um, established a pin number and those are required to access the databases um, now I use Wake County as as the example here but these same databases are available in almost any county library system. So if you're in Durham County, Orange County, wherever, uh, the, the same capability exists. Um, I, I see another question. How often is the uh, data updated? Um, Pretty consistently is what I'm gonna say. I can't give you an ex exact one, but I will tell you, I have a good bit of familiarity with the Reference USA database. It is the predominant business data database that's used in industry. And so it is consistently updated. And then the next question that usually gets asked is, well, how accurate is the data? And, and on its best day, it's probably 80, 85% accurate, which, you know, given databases and how dynamic businesses and people are, a database that's that accurate of that size is a really accurate database. Mm -hmm. um, I see a question, where do you look for the consumer market? Uh, if you remember the slide where I circled U.S. businesses, one column over and four items down is a consumer and lifestyle database. You click on that and that would give you the ability to get information on, on your market if you have a consumer market. Now, in addition to that, if you have a consumer market, there's also property tax records. Um, that can give you considerable amounts of information um, about markets, neighborhoods, how many homes, average income, et cetera. Any other questions on target market? I will offer this. I've, I've worked with a lot of small business owners uh, and it's amazing to me how frequently they want to skip over this and, and how significant an impact it has on the success of their business when they don't skip over it, when they actually do the work, figure out what their target market is, and then do the work to identify who is actually in that market. Mr. Davis, you had just referenced being able to see property information, um, other market information that might be geared toward a, a consumer um, around median income and value of property and things of that sort. How might we use that information to, to our benefit? as we're um, putting our business plans together and zoning in on our, on our target markets. Let, let me ask what, what type of business are you developing? That, that allows me to answer your question specific because it can vary. <laughs> I understand. Um, so consulting and also coaching. Okay. And who is it you, who, what do you think? What's the shaping of your target market? Who do you want to consult or coach? 
Uh, for coaching, it would be those in positions of leadership um, over the age of 40, making approximately 150,000 a year. So they see the value in leadership coaching um, okay. and, and making that investment. So, so here's what I would probably do if that was my market. I would, I would go actually into the business database um, and I would look for um, publicly held businesses probably doing over a hundred million a year. And I would ask the database to list all of the executive positions that they have. I think they, I think they carry something like up to 15 executive positions. Um, and that would give you a set of individuals. Let's say there are, if there were, uh, 2000 businesses in the area doing over a uh, hundred million dollars. And there are 15 executives in each of those businesses, which is, which is probably reasonable. Then 15 times 200 is 33,000. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's about right. Okay, it's 3,000 or 30,000, I'm sorry. But anyway, my point is that probably is plenty of prospects given however many coaching clients you'd want in each year. Okay. Is that, is that helpful? That is very helpful, thank you. Okay, very good. And if it was... Um, managers or leaders in certain type of businesses, then, then I would even uh, filter by, the, by those types of businesses. Okay. You know, like if you were primarily focused, say, in the healthcare industry or in the manufacturing industry or the transportation industry, you can specify that in that database to pull that information. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other target market questions? And, I, and I'm going to go back and make a point. But see, this, this concern that I mentioned earlier about the market not being big enough when you target, target, the discussion we just went through was a good example. You know, on the one hand, executives in 2,000 businesses seems to be small when you think how many professionals there are in the triangle. But three, a market of 3,000 is, is more than enough for the number of clients that you probably would want in a year and year over year. You know, because I happen to know from my coaching experiences about the most clients you can handle at a time is 15 or 16. <laughs> Bill, there's a, there is one more question. It's not so much target market. It's more around how to reach it's more around marketing, I think. Um, so what's the best way to reach a uh, consumer market? Yeah, again, that depends on um, what segment of the consumer market. So I'm going to ask um, the person that posed the question, who and what consumers are you looking to do business with? Um. I guess people who uh, help uh, uh, people, I guess influencers or people who are in influential positions that can in, in engage other people in the educational setting or learning. It kind of vague in it, isn't it? It's like I have a product, I wanna sell it to the world, but I know I can't, everybody won't necessarily gravitate towards it, but I want to expose the product as much as I can. And I'm trying to figure out, do I kind of find people for that? Or do I just kind of go like the, into Facebook and say, okay, I want black women who are a certain age or, or mixed couples who are a certain age, or, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Um, so, so here's what I would offer Lillian in terms of that, a couple of things. Number one, 
you know, the movie of Field of Dreams, build it and they will come. That is not the case for small business. I, I get it. <laughs> you, you do have to go after who you want to do business with. Yeah. The, the second thing is the thing to do is to figure out or choose as specifically as you can who you think you want to do business with. Then you could, that would give you a, an opportunity to figure out the answer of how to reach them. And the other thing is when you choose a target market, it doesn't have to be forever. So I may choose a target market, do the things that it takes to go after that target market and find out that that, that doesn't, that they don't see value. Mm -hmm. Well, then I would identify another target market. Okay. But I know by, by selecting that target market and focusing my resources on it, that if it didn't work, I'd know it didn't work because it's not the right market, as opposed to wondering if I had had more resource, would it have possibly worked? Yeah. Got it. Bill, I got it. I got it. I'll, I'll tell myself on that one. Um, when I first started, uh, you know, it's the reality, right? What you're talking yeah. about. When I first started Pathfinder, you know, I had mapped out, you know, a total methodology on organizational excellence and all the components and all the tools and everything. And I kept thinking, man, if, if small businesses and startups had this, this met methodology, when they first started, they'll ramp up faster, they'll hire better, they'll have a better culture from the beginning, they'll be set up for massive growth. And I did all that research and picked my industry that I wanted to hear in the area and met them where they were. And it was easy because there was, there was uh, some networking events that, that housed those businesses. Um, and this was the first month where I'd kind of hold, help, uh, put my shingle up. And I was so excited because I came home and I probably had, you know, 20 cards and 10 meetings the next day. And I was like, oh, this is, this is it. This is gravy. I went to my first three or four meetings. Awesome. They were excited. They saw it. They saw the need, everything. And then we got down to dollars and realized they were just broke. So <laughs> they, they couldn't afford it, right? Um, you know, where they were. So that was around about the same time, Bill, you and I started talking. And <laughs> Bill walked me through this, this same platform. And I said, okay, all right, I got to revamp and re relook where I'm, where I'm targeted. Who can afford this tool? Who would still see value in it? So on and so forth. So yeah, you, you, you definitely, you definitely can make iterations and learn, you know, kind of learn as you go, but uh, it, it, <laughs> and then as you grow as well, right. You know, you start getting your legs under you, you start getting referrals, you start getting, you know, expanding your 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 capabilities and things like that or maybe your team and then you can maybe step yourself to a larger target market but you've done it in a very concise and stepwise approach you've you've you've, you've grown with it right you've kind of found your sweet spot and then grown with it as you're ready to expand so very good yeah. I, I i've got two other questions i'm going to address those and then i'm going to move on to the next item and then when we get to the q a if there are also additional questions about target market i'll address them also so one of them is uh if you're looking up your target market would you need to change it if your business can't see the value in it and the answer to that is yes um and that also speaks to one of the real benefits of doing or creating a business plan. It allows you to step through the business before you go live or step through a possible change in the business before you actually make it. But if, but if the market you select doesn't see value in your product or service, or if what they can pay, just as uh, Jay was saying, what they are willing to pay for that product or service isn't a sufficient for your business to be successful, you'd want to select another target market. Um, and then the other question is, can you do some testing in your current surrounding or neighborhood and then narrow down based on the feedback? 
uh, you can, but you would want your neighborhood or surroundings to be um, ideal for what you think your target market is. Okay, you want to do your testing in, in in places that you think it is the answer, so that if it doesn't work, you you know you were testing in the right place. You, does that make sense? Okay, I'm assuming no no response that it that it uh, that it does. But you want to like if I think my if I think my product is for businesses that do a half million to five million dollars a year, it won't be helpful for me to test it on micro businesses, smaller businesses, you, because the characteristics are different. So if it worked there, it may not indicate that it would work in larger businesses and vice versa. Okay. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to talking about knowing your business environment and SWOT. And as I said, when I get to the next Q&A section, if you have any additional questions about target market, you can ask them then. So um, Jay introduced SWOT yes, uh, last week. I'm going to spend more time on it. SWOT uh, is a, uh, a very straightforward, uh, time-tested and proven uh, business planning tool. And SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Okay, now strengths and weaknesses are strengths and weaknesses of your business. Opportunities and threats. Well, let me go back. And as a result of them being strengths and weaknesses, they are under your control you can do something about them. Opportunities and threats are external to your business, but will probably impact your business. And they are beyond your control. All you can do relative to opportunities and threats is to react to them or benefit from them, okay? So what I've done, I had a, a business coaching and consulting business. Um, and what I've done is so you can, so I can step you through a SWOT analysis and what to do with what you get out of a SWOT analysis. I'm actually gonna use my, my business. And so when I started my business, I had three, well, I'm, I'm identifying here three strengths. One, business knowledge. I had spent 28 years in corporate, uh, spent a lot of time in sales and selling and marketing to businesses. And so I had learned a lot about businesses, how they work, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, I had a very unique service offering. There weren't many other uh, business coaching type operations in the area offering what I was offering. And the other thing is I was very well networked because I actually had spent the three previous years uh, participating very much in a business referral organization. As a result, I had gotten connected to, to an awful lot of people. So those were my strengths. Uh, my weaknesses were the following. Number one, business location. The fact was I actually did not have a business location. Credibility, because this was a brand new business in a different way. And the market as a whole, while I was well networked, the market as a whole didn't know me for what I was gonna be doing in this business. And then the third thing is I had a very, very lean promotion budget, advertising budget, to use to create visibility so people would know I, I existed. So those are my strengths, those are my weaknesses. The opportunities in my market were as follows. Number one, the triangle has a very large number of small businesses and my market was small businesses. Secondly, companies, corporations 
we're continuing to downsize. And that downsizing, the result of that was people would leave corporate and want to start their own business. That was a real plus or an opportunity for me. And then the triangle area was an attractive place to live. So I, there were people coming into the area. So I had one, there were already a lot of small businesses. Two, companies were in essence taking actions that resulted in additional business owners in the marketplace. And because the triangle area was attractive, there were people moving to the triangle to either continue their businesses or start a business, et cetera. Here were the threats that I had though. One, there were an awful lot of business coaches in the triangle area, okay? Secondly, uh, online training was in the eyes of small businesses, a viable alternative to training and I mean, to, to, to uh, training and coaching. And then third, economic cycles. You know, I have no control over the economy. It goes up, it goes down. I can't do anything about that. So those were my strengths, my weaknesses, my opportunities and threats. Now, the key is not just to identify them, but once you identify them, you want to do what you can to benefit from the strengths and opportunities and reduce the impact of the threats and the weaknesses. And let me show you a way of doing that. And that is to do a risk analysis. Now, I'm going to give you a minute to adjust to this chart, but the information laid out differently is the same information that was on the other chart, okay? And it's laid out this way so that I can then, for each of my strengths, answer the following question, which is how does every strength take advantage of each opportunity? So for example, and, and use a scale of one to 10, your, your rating will be subjective based on your best judgment. So does my business knowledge take advantage of uh, a, a large number of small businesses? I said that was a 10, because the more people in small business, some more places I could apply my business knowledge. Companies continuing to downsize. Well, people coming out and wanting to start a business you know, would be looking for help. My business knowledge would be beneficial there. So I rated that a nine. Uh, triangle area, attractive to attractive place to live. My business knowledge doesn't have much leverage on that. So I rated that a five. Um, and then <clears throat> going across, uh, how does my strength impact the threats? Uh, there are lots of business coaches my business knowledge, I thought that was a, an eight because I thought I probably had more experience than most other business coaches because most other business coaches didn't start into business coaching after completing a, a complete career as I had. <laughs> um, in terms of online training, I thought my business knowledge rated about the same way economic cycles, the same thing. I add that across, I get a score. You can see <clears throat> how I rated the other items. Um, so you can see how to do that and you can see the questions that are used. But then the key thing is to look and see which are the most impactful. So if I look large number of small businesses is very impactful because I take that all the way through. That's a 51. Business knowledge is very impactful. It's a 48. My business location has a big negative impact. It's the lowest score of 20 and the economic cycles were 32. Okay. With that analysis, the question is, what can I do about that so that, again, I benefit from the strengths and opportunities of, that I can, 
and that I minimize or mitigate the impact of the, um, of the weaknesses and threats. And so I created three strategies or tactics to overcome those because that's what there is to do. Come up with what will my strategy be or what tactics will I use to maximize the strengths and opportunities and mitigate the weaknesses and threats. So two that were low were business location and credibility. And so what I decided to do, because remember I didn't even have a place to do business if I wanted to work with groups of small business owners. So what I did is I became a member of the, of the City Club of Raleigh, which was a business club considered credible, somewhat prestigious, et cetera. And that's where I conducted my programs. And so that gave me a location, frankly, that had full capabilities, meeting spaces, meals, the, the accompanying staff to, to manage all of that. And I benefited from the credibility of the, the City Club of Raleigh. So that's how I mitigated that, those weaknesses. In terms of the economic cycle, I built a program around small businesses succeeding in good times and bad. And the idea was that whether things were going well in the economy, or things were going not so well, that could still be attractive to small business owners. Obviously, if things are going well, they're looking to do better. If things are going bad, they're probably being very selective, but they really, they really do want to get some way and understanding of how to get through the tough times. And so I built a program that spoke specifically to that. And then the thing that was strongest for me, business knowledge, the way that I leveraged that is that my approach to working with clients was what I called, my, my marketing slogan was, I get in the trenches with my clients. And so in other words, in just providing them conceptual information about what to do in their business, et cetera, the way that I worked with them is I applied it specifically to their business, their situation. So those are examples of strategies and tactics to overcome the weaknesses and threats that I identified in my uh, SWOT and resulting risk analysis and how to benefit from the strengths or opportunities. Now you can see, I think I was like most business owners, that is, I had more threats and weaknesses to try to mitigate than I had st strengths uh, to, to benefit from. But I don't think that's un uncommon. So that's the power or the benefit of a SWOT analysis. You do the analysis, then you turn it into a risk assessment or risk analysis, and then you go to work developing strategies and tactics, again, to overcome the weaknesses and threats and to benefit from the strengths and opportunities. Okay, questions about that? Bill, I don't see any questions, but I do wanna share this, this comment. And I, I, I actually happen to agree. Um, Chanel says, I've taken many business classes over the last five to seven years, and this is the best explanation, description of how to use a SWOT in terms of application. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Okay, any, if, if there are no questions about SWOT, are there any additional questions about um, target market? I'll jump in here if there's no other questions. Um, Mr. Davis, in addition to coaching, consulting is also a service um, that I will offer. And the closest I've come to identifying my consulting client is, um, is because I like the way it sounds. And I'm, I'm, I'm posing the question because I'm 
open it, you can um, help me define it a little bit. But the closest I've come to it is a high performing organizations. Um, and that's because I, I believe that high performing organizations will wanna make the investment in the consulting services that I provide, which is around um, employee engagement, diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as leadership development. So I'm going to give you a marketing answer, I think, more than uh, than not. And that is, I think that I would target that kind of consulting to organizations that aspire to be high performing. Because the high performing organizations have probably already secured consulting services that help get them there. That's great. Thank you. Is that helpful? Oh, that's very helpful. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. that, that also helps me to deal with some confidence things too. Thank you. Because that was my sure. thought too. If they're already high performing, somebody's either in-house providing those services or, you know, maybe they're working with the big four. So thank you. Yeah. I mean, because very, very few organizations can do that on their own. I mean, if you just look at the nature of what it is and what it takes, it's rare that a company can achieve that without outside help. Mm-hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, well, uh, how do you develop key categories for each SWAT category? Um, if I understand, you mean like I had three items under strengths and three items under weakness? Yes, okay. you, you were able to clearly identify succinctly what your strengths and weaknesses were and also the threats and opportunities in a way that you could arrive at a, at a smart risk analysis. Yeah, so, so I'm, I, I mean, you, we really have to do the work. We have to take a look. Uh, we have to be um, objective about it. And I, I mean, that's around our strengths and weaknesses, around the opportunities and threats. We have, to, we have to do some research. We have to learn our business environment and market so that we can you know, make some judgments about how do we quote unquote compare to it. Now, for me, it was easy to find out there were lots of business coaches in the triangle. One, because I was so well networked, you know? Um, but but it takes work. It's not something. It's it's not like an idea. In other words, you know, I can sit down and and think for thirty minutes and come up with an idea. A SWOT analysis takes takes work, time. I think this is it. Now I've learned something else. Oh, you know what? It's this instead of that. So I mean, it's a it's a it's a project. Is what I'd say. And then, you know, I had to make it succinct to teach it. So I, you know, don't, <laughs> it didn't come to be that way initially. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, with that, uh, because I want to make sure we have uh, appropriate time, I'm going to complete my, um, my, what I'm presenting for tonight. And I'm going to, turn the floor over to Dr. Angie Arrington for her contribution this evening. Thank you, Bill. You're more wow, than that was very insightful. And I am super grateful for the opportunity to hear your talk for my own business. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. So tonight, I'm going to be talking a little bit about developing the business owner's mindset with a focus really on your personal and professional development, the things that you need to do. So these are those things that are pivotal or critical to the success of your business, the things that come from who you are as a business owner, entrepreneur, leader. Um, and tonight I decided to take the approach around focusing on the heart, 
the head, the hands, and the habit. And I got the idea from Kim Blanchard. So I went old school, Bill. And um, I love Blanchard in this particular work because I want to talk about what we often call soft skills. And, and I've actually, I'm on a, I have a movement going, Patty. And the movement that I have around this is anytime we think of something soft, we tend to, you know, it's not strong. So is it weak? Um, it's not hard. So does that mean it's not as valuable? Because that's what we refer to when we talk about communication, when we talk about leadership, when we talk about relationship building, when we talk about problem solving, decision making, and whatever it is we're bringing to the table, it's often referred to as soft skills. And I heard the word emotional intelligence raised earlier in the discussion. And to me, these are core skills. So that's my movement. My movement is to challenge us to evolve, pun intended, for those who don't know, I have a company I named Evolve, and I'll, I'll reference that later around why I chose that in terms of who I am. So I wanted to open with that to give you a little background on that. Servant leadership is a word that we use so very loosely. You know, leadership in general, we use very loosely in terms of what leadership is and what leadership isn't. And so what I want to help you put your arms around tonight really is, do you ever wonder how, first of all, let me define leadership. So leadership really is the ability to influence people, a team of people to help you achieve a set outcome or goal. So not just to influence them to help you, influence them to collaborate, to work toward the mark, and to get there as a team, because there really is no I in team, and we really can't do what we do alone. Uh, the work that Bill just talked about requires help. It requires engaging with other people. And so I wanted to also raise servant leadership here uh, and interject it in this part of the conversation about our businesses, because we're service providers. Regardless of whether you have a product or a service, you're providing something to a base of customers. And what Bill taught us tonight is you're either selling it or providing it business to business or business to co consumer. So B, B to B or B to C. And in that, what I'm proposing to you is how can you position yourself and strengthen your core skills to be stronger in your personal and professional development. So when you walk in the room to pitch your business, that you're walking in that level of confidence, that you're walking in the level of having done the work. Bill, I'm so glad you talked about it. We often, I did, I'm on business 13. I would often put the cart before the horse because I wanted to just get out there and do what I do and serve the world. Well, there's a process leaders as to how we do that. And that process has to do with doing the work. So putting the shingle up and saying, this is what I do and getting customers to pay for the service that you're offering. Yes, that's entrepreneurship or, you know, an exchange, et cetera. To sustain it though, because that's what we're here to teach you. We're here to teach you the techniques, skills, knowledge that you need and providing resources that you need to sustain the business. We all know that most businesses fail before year five. Why is that? Sometimes it's not because we can't find clients. It's do we have the sustainability? So I really want to raise that. And I wanted to raise it from the perspective of, do you often wonder how do they do that? Like, how is this person always successful? How are they always showing up here or there um, do they ever get tired? Um, how can they manage all of this? I'm thinking like, you know, the, these mega entrepreneurs. So last week, Jay um, educated us about the difference. So you think about Oprah Winfrey and before she got all the money and all the success that she achieved, she was an ordinary person like us. 
She was a TV anchor person making whatever that entry level salary was that she was making. And she had to do the work. So what we see today is years and years of refinement and work and self-development. And so it comes with this mindset. Last week, Darlene put set us on fire around mindset and she gave us a list of 20 things that we can focus on. And a big piece of that is, you know, if you believe you can, you will. And if you believe you can't, you won't. So it's really that simplistic. So I wanted to talk about, about that piece tonight and how most of us operate from the head and from the hands. So we think about something that we want to do and then we go do it. And what Bill taught us tonight is before you go out here calling on clients, Angie, <laughs> you need to do the work. You need to put together the business plan, develop the business plan. You need to do the SWOT analysis. He even taught us how to do it. So that myth of, well, I don't know how and no one has ever showed me. Tonight, you can't say that. And Bill, it looks pretty daggone easy when you think about the steps you showed us. The real work is going to come when we identify those 2,000, 1,000, whatever number of businesses that is, and creating some type of plan or hopefully using some type of app is what I would recommend to you. There are lots of them out here. Dubzato is a great client app, Salesforce, and I'm sure some of you have others you can drop in the chat along the way, but, but doing the work and being diligent and following up. So we think about it. We're thinkers. And we're doers. And so what I'm proposing to you tonight is a focus on how can we be intentional about expanding that thought and those hands into the core existence of who we are and creating habits that help with that. So when I think about Bill and the, the success he did have, uh, I ran into Bill in my early days here. He was out and about. He was everywhere. He was one of those people that, you know, everywhere you went, like popcorn, he just kept popping up. And he was always smiling and he was always doing business. And what else I noticed about Bill is he was always helping people. He was always willing to help people and still is. You know, he played golf all day today <laughs> and he's here now willing to be supportive and provide that help. And so we have to think about our own leadership as business owners and how are we leading? How are we engaging the people that we engage to help us, whether we hire them, whether we contract or subcontract, uh, whether however we do it, you know, it's really important to understand the type of leader you are. And so I wanted to raise that piece tonight for us to think about as well. I'm gonna move. Oops. And so when you go to the heart of the matter, I want to talk about who are you at the core and what courage do you have and how will you manage that? And it really starts with those intentions. If you followed us for the last three series, you've heard the word intentions and being intentional about what you do, how you do it, when you do it, and why you do it. And it starts with that business plan. So you cannot escape doing the business plan. And what we're telling you is that that plan is fluid and that that plan does not function on its own solely. So this would be the technical side of the business, if you will. And what I'm talking to you about are the core skills. And what I'm saying to you tonight is those core skills come from within you. And so the intentions to develop those weaknesses. So you can also do a SWOT analysis on yourself. Right, Jay? And in the process of doing that self-SWOT analysis, you can identify, and that's really what Bill did. It was about his business. And in the beginning, he was the business. And in the beginning, being the business, what he looked at is, what, what do I bring to the table? What is my value proposition? What unique thing can I offer out here among all these coaches and business consultants here in the, the RDU community. And so being intentional about that, and there's an attitude that comes with that, not an attitude of ego or 
you know, any type of self-indulgence. And actually it's an attitude of humility really and gratitude, but it's an attitude of, it's a can-do attitude. It's I'm intending to excel and achieve at whatever those business goals are that you outline in your plan. And here are my strengths and the things that I know I'm good at. And that's what I'm going to focus on. And I'm going to hire to my weaknesses. I'm going to hire people who are stronger at whatever those things are that I'm not good at. And being able to be intentional about that is so important. And then there's the C word. There's a lot of C words, but character is everything. Who you are and being consistent in who you are as a business owner is really about the core of who you are. You know, when you think about character, what type of integrity do you have? What type of work ethic do you have? If you tell a client you're going to show up, are you going to show up? And how present are you going to be? And are you going to be prepared? And if you tell a client you're going to deliver something by a certain time, do you have the wherewithal to deliver it? Because today you had a client issue that took up your entire day and now it's tonight and you didn't get to work on it. That character means I have to stay up half the night, all night, sometimes to get that done. So it's a level of commitment. It's a moral character and it really distinguishes who you are. So what sets people apart? You know, I hear people on here who are doing some of the same kinds of things that, that I'm doing and Jay is doing. And one of the things I'll never forget uh, when I first met Jay, we met at a social networking event. Oh, it was a score event, actually. And um, when we introduced and exchanged business cards, we both looked at each other's card and realized we were direct competitors. And rather than us going to some competitive, um, awkward moment around it, we looked at each other and said, man, I'm so glad to meet you and that you're willing to greet me and uh, embrace me as someone who um, I can collaborate with. And we immediately started collaborating. I was in over my head working on some RFPs, needed somebody on the team, needed someone to go in with me. And what Jay shared with me was he had recently met someone just the day or two before he had that same mindset Jay did. In fact, I think this person was a veteran. So Jay was coming at it. Hey, you're a fellow vet. We can, this guy zoomed across the room and treated Jay like he had a plague. Instead of seeing the opportunity, the O in the SWAT, both personally and professionally, instead of him seeing that as an opportunity, what did his character say? A whole lot. So two things. Who did I call last night when I had questions around a proposal that I'm doing? Yes. <laughs> Angie. And who's not in business anymore? Unfortunately, that, that individual. Right, right. And so when we think about character and actually had that person built, great point. Thank you for adding that. Because had that person took the time to build a relationship with Jay, Jay's doing great right now. He might have been able to say, hey, man. I need some help. And he might have not necessarily needed the help, but saw an opportunity to, to pay it forward. So that's the kind of character I'm talking about. I'm also talking about values. What are your values? What's important to you? Why do you do what you do? And um, we live in a society where we're becoming so valueless as leaders. So my, my, passion is leadership, as many of you know, is strategic leadership. And when I look at it and, and read about it, which I do often, the one thing that stands out is there's so little focus on values-based leadership, integrity in the workplace, what we do when no one sees, uh, being authentic and consistent with who you are and being able to say, you know what, that's a great opportunity. And I don't do that. And because I don't do that, type of consulting. I'm going to pass that on to Chanel. She's in the HR side of things and has that relationship, experience, knowledge. Those are the values that we have to find within ourselves. There is so much lack of commitment. There is so much lack of uh, trust in the workforce and in business. And we don't seek feedback. 
We want feedback that says we're doing a great job. You're the best, loved it. I want people like the people on this team to give me feedback because if I go to Bill, when I go to Bill, he's not going to sugarcoat it. He's going to be very respectful, very compassionate gentleman, but he's going to tell me the truth. And how can we do better when we don't know better has been something that I've said for a long time. And then I heard T.D. Jake say the other night, and even when we know better, we still don't do better. And he used himself as an example. Like many of us, he's on his weight loss journey. And he said, you know, I know I'm not supposed to have that cream brulee, which is one of his favorites, especially since I just had butter on the bread. And yet we still do it. And so what value is he placing on this? Because it's one thing for me to say, you know, this sort of mouthpiece or talk the talk. But is my walk aligned to it? Am I making healthier choices? So when you think about, about that value and the value you're placing in your business, what type of value are you placing around the work you do? And what message are you sending to your customers? And then the last piece, when I think about the heart or the servant leader, when you think about who you are to the core, what perspective are you operating out of? Are you operating out of your cup is half full? Are you operating out of this half empty? Or are you operating around that it's overflowing? It just hasn't manifested yet. That's where I am. I'm believing the goals I've set for myself to be that multi-million dollar entity to help the people that I desire to help. And so what I'm saying is by the yard is hard, inch by inch is a cinch. Or I'm saying start small and grow tall. And what Bill is telling us is to do the work on the front end so that we can be prepared for the growth that happens. That's how scalability happens. You have to have a plan and you have to follow that plan. And so to the heart of the matter, you know, Blanchard talks about being selfless as leaders. And I'm not suggesting that we neglect ourselves. I'm not suggesting that we don't take care of ourselves. I'm saying, how can we think about the why of what we do in our businesses to the core? And how can we use that why to help others? How can we shift from focusing so much of climbing the ladder for ourselves um, that we don't think about building or holding the ladder for others? That's what this group of people are doing. That's why I am a part of it and, and enjoy being a part of it. So instead of mimicking servant leadership, the question I, I, I leave you with as you think about your core is how can you self-reflect and challenge yourself to be better at the core and use these concepts to help you do that? So next, I want to talk a little bit about transformational leadership are the head. I talked about the, is the head. I talked about the head in, in the beginning around most of us. Um, we use our head. We think about it. We sit around and we think of ideas and, and the things that we can do, et cetera. And so at the core of, of our hearts is how we feel. It's the emotion. And of course, in, at the core of our thinking is, is cognitive, cognitive ability or cognition. And so I read some research. Y'all know I'm a researcher. And what I recognized or learned is that 68% of people who were surveyed, this is from an Inc. magazine survey, they agreed that following one's heart clouds one's judgment. So they're comparing thinking to feeling or cognition to emotion. And then there was another data point that they pointed out that 64% believe that following one's head over heart when choosing a career is pivotal to success. So this is, this is in the head space. I'm not gonna disagree with that. This data speaks for itself. What I will say to you and what studies also show is that when people are doing things from the heart and doing what they love, what they like, what they enjoy, they tend to produce more, be high. We talk about high performers. We tend to perform better, you know, and when we're misaligned and not doing those things that we enjoy doing, 
we don't perform as well. And so the data point that stands out to me, this was before COVID. And that data point is that the average worker is only producing about 60% out of a day at work. The other 40%, they're at the water cooler, they're on the computer shopping, surfing, um, they're do maybe doing other things, they could be absent from work, et cetera. So these are all points around the importance of enjoying what you do. And the reason we are starting these businesses is for many reasons in terms of what your why is, but we believe one of them is to make money. Even in a nonprofit organization, you need to get paid, you need to pay the bills, whether it's your personal bills or to operate your business. And so we have to understand that in order to be transformational leaders, we have to take some risks and we have to be willing to do the things that's going to help us to transform. So there was another study that I looked at around cognition versus emotion. And what this said is that this, in, in both cases, 1,100 plus people were surveyed. So 16% of the people in this survey regretted changing careers over following their hearts and 15% regretted following their head. So this was later. So this first survey was done about five years ago. This is a more recent survey. You see the shift? We are finally at a time in society where we're deciding that I'm going to follow my heart and I'm going to do what I love. So another point that really stood out to me is that 60% who followed their hearts are satisfied with their current job compared to 50% who I said had with their heart. So what I'm saying is that humbling moment, right? So what I'm saying is that we're very close, that people are really starting to align their heart and their head around doing what they love. And so I'm encouraging you, you stepped out on faith or you're in the process of stepping out on faith to either launch your business or expand your business. How can you be confident in trusting yourself that you have what it takes to do what you do? And the best way to determine that is to follow the plans that we've been giving you. And if you're not sure about that and you don't have a score mentor or haven't been assigned one, you're getting one, build that relationship and use that. Because at the end of the day, it is so important oops, for us to balance our heart and our head. Make sense? So I wanna talk a little bit about the hands now. So the hands is another area that we spend more time. I see that as collaborative leadership, being able to reach out and partner with other people and uh, collaborate and work together. Um, I spent quite a bit of time during COVID uh, improving my own online learning and my own core development around being a better communicator, around being a better leader, around the things that I'm saying to you. So I'm not just talking the talk to you. I'm actually applying this. And one of the things that stands out is showing others how it's done. And that's what we're doing here tonight. And in all of these sessions is, you know, I love that compliment to Bill. We are, this is not just telling you and showing you, but literally giving you examples. Bill so um, thoroughly demonstrated with real examples. And so now we know how. We don't have to wonder, hmm, I'm a little intimidated by this because I've never done this. So not only do we need to see it, we need to pass this knowledge on. That's the collaboration piece. That is definitely a value and a skill set and an ability that can help you be better. We need to lead by example. Leading by example is so important when we think about the work that we're doing in our own businesses. You never know who's looking up to you or who's who you're going to need to support you along the way. So just remember, people are watching you. People are listening to what you say, what you do, how you do it, when you do it, et cetera. And then we also want to empower other people. So this journey of business ownership, it combines leadership. They run parallel. 
You're not going to have one without the other, not successfully. And if leadership is not a strong suit for you, I'm encouraging you to focus on developing those skills and strengthening those skills. How many of you, and you can drop it in the chat, how many of you believe that leaders are natural born, naturally born? And most leaders are naturally born leaders. I can't see the chat right now, but I'm assuming you're dropping in there and I'm assuming some of you think yes. Most leaders and more leaders are made than naturally born. Just like most business owners are made versus naturally made. So when Bill started that business out, however long ago it was, all the experience that he's gained on top of the work experience that he already had, on top of what he's learned from self-development, reading books, going to seminars and training sessions, and now with online learning, we have no excuse. And so being able to build that knowledge base to be a better leader, to be a better communicator, to develop those core skills. So Patty chuckles when I say this, and I have to say this at any point, I can say it. Your brand means a lot. It means a lot in how you collaborate and who wants to collaborate with you. Part of why Jay and I were so readily able to agree that we could collaborate instantaneously is because the conversation we were having was very clear that we were aligned in terms of knowledge, level of skill, capability, and a willingness to give and take, because that is also a very important piece. The last piece, when you think about it, you have to be willing to get your own hands dirty. There can't be anything in your business that you're not willing to do if you're going to expect others to do it. And so when I think about leadership and I think about service and I think about the heart, the hands, the head, and I haven't even gone into the habits yet, but what I think about is a leader that I've researched a lot, a leader, uh, uh, early leader. I think about Jesus Christ as a leader. And when I think about him as a leader and the example that I want to use around leading by example, getting your own hands dirty, showing how it's done, as well as empowering others, I want to talk about um, the foot washing aspect of what happened. He did not wash the disciples' feet because they were dirty, necessarily. Some of them probably were. He also didn't do it to fix them. We can't fix people. People don't need to be fixed. And if people need to be fixed, they have to see that for themselves and desire to be fixed. So as leaders, we have to be willing to perform whatever those duties are. And in the example I use, he did that to show them service and the value of service and the humility that he was willing to commit to for them. So when you think about your organization and whoever's going to work in your company to help you, whether you contract it out or not, these are just some examples of how to lead and how to collaborate and how to use those core skills to create that value in those relationships so that people will be willing to work with you. I want to be on a team with someone that's willing to get down in the trenches with me. That was part of why that was so successful for Bill, because Getting in the trenches with one says that I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and do the same thing that you're doing to help you along the way. So when I think about the hands, I think I went too quickly. Oh, no, I have two slides. So when I think about the hands, there are, are 10 things that I want you to focus on as you think about the things that you do on a daily basis. One is pray and meditate however you choose. And I'm certainly not getting into a space of influencing you one way or the other. It's an important way to start your day. It's also important to have gratitude and focus on being. Sometimes we get so caught up on doing, we forget how to be, to just be, be still, be confident, be willing, be patient, be. And then smile. It's the best way to shift your energy. Sometimes we have days where we're running, running, running. You know, I rushed in here to jump on this Zoom after a very long work day. And so I took a moment to just pause. And I know Darlene's out there. And um, that's something that she promotes very highly 
is the ability to just shift and pause. And one way to do that is a quick smile. Uh, eat well. It's so easy to eat fast food and eat foods that are not healthy for us, that it's going to deplete our energy when we know we have a long day ahead of us. How can we eat well and balance that? And for me, it's all about meal prep, prepping my meals and making sure I have the groceries that I need that's going to prevent me from falling to those other habits that aren't as healthy. Because when you're working 12 to 14 to 16 hour days, and I'm telling you, sometimes that's real for us. Eating well at least can give your body some nourishment until you can get back on a schedule. And I know Darlene is shaking her head like, you know, you need eight hours of sleep, Dr. Angie. And you are so right. I know that. Exercise daily. And sometimes we don't have time to exercise, exercise, walk, stand up. I set a timer every hour on the hour. And as a part of that set timer, I'm standing and stretching and hydrating throughout the day. These are all things that are going to help you be better. Practice time management. You got to plan that day out. I calendar the office work because when I am in the office, I don't want to get in there and end up not spending my time wisely. So it's calendared out. Set daily intentional goals. And those daily intentional goals need to be specific to whatever else it is. And it ties back to that business plan, back to that SWAT, back to those things that you need to do to grow your business. Seek inspiration. It's hard out here. We're here to help you. And we're also here to encourage you and to inspire you. And the people in your circle, if they're not inspiring you and helping you, do you really need them in your circle? Someone told me, you are the sum of the top five people in your circle. And when I thought about that, I'm seeing some of you nodding. When I thought about that and I thought about who those top five people were, I had to make some changes. There were some people in the top of that list that really were not adding any value to where I was trying to go in terms of the inspiration and the things that I was trying to do. We also have to be a good steward. You know, if you are, if you're trying to claim and you want to manifest abundance, you have to be a good steward over what you already have before you can add more to it. And we have to make room for it. So you also have to be willing to give something away in order to gain something else. I had that happen. So I ended up taking on a project that was more like a contract than a consulting arrangement, like a contractor. So I'm a quasi employee and it was for six months and I was sure, oh, I can manage through the six months. I ended up having to make a decision, Bill. I see you chuckling. I had to make a decision to reach back out to say, this is not a good fit for me. I was so relieved when I did that because it was misaligned. It was too much. And we have to really be focused on and it was a valuable lesson learned. I knew when I took that, that it wasn't the right fit. And I took it for the wrong reason. I took it for the money. We cannot make money the priority. Yes, it's important. Les Brown says it's up there with oxygen. You have to have it to live. I agree with that. At the same time, trading hours for dollars, it's a job, right? It's just over broke. It's a mentality. And part of that mentality is what we bring into our businesses because most of us are coming out of a job. We're coming out of a just over broke, a mentality. I work eight hours a day. You pay me X dollars an hour or whatever that flat fee is for your annual salary. And this is what you get. As business owners, that's not how it is. If you thinking that's what it is, you may need to rethink your business. And in the world of Patty Williams, she will tell you on budget and tracking your spending. If your business plan financials went at the end of this program, when you submit or pre pre prepare your financials, and when you look at that, if you don't see a way to make any money, Patty Williams will tell you, then you shouldn't start that business. So these things are so important uh, to that process. And then the habits we need to have, I have to go back with leading with integrity, with having the self-discipline that it's going to take. Sometimes I have to get up at 4 a.m., leave home by 5.36 a.m. to get where I'm going for the day. That requires self-discipline. And I love this one. What do we do when no one sees? 
that really gets to the core of the values that we have and the integrity that we have. These are those habits that we have to, that have to be made. They have to be created. The other thing is don't play games. Don't play games with people. If you know that's not a good fit for you, or if you know that you can't deliver, don't play with people. Just be upfront. It's going to be better for you in the long run. The other piece is do what you love. Really focus on doing what you love. And I want to jump into finding your rhythm and your flow. I realize I'm running out of time here, but know your why. I talked about knowing your why. The why, why, why are you doing this? If you haven't done it already, you need to write a personal vision statement around why you're in this business, why you want to have this business. It has to be more than money. It could be a part of it. Then you have to be the best you. And the preparation that comes with being the best you, whatever that's going to take, that's what you have to do. You also have to find ways to have many M-I-N-I -I, celebrations along the way um, and have many M-A-N-Y. So many, many celebrations along the way. And then you have to check in with yourself. Am I still enjoying this? You know, are my financials where I need them to be? Can I afford to continue to do this? What sacrifices am I making to my family or my children or whatever else that thing is? And then we have to do what you love. Because if you don't love what you're doing, you're probably not going to be satisfied with it, which means you're not going to be the best at it you can be. And the last advice I have for you tonight is journaling. It doesn't have to be a whole paragraph even. It could be one word. It's a great way to brain dump at the end of the day. And I know when Darlene comes back, up uh, at a future point, and I think Sharon is going to be coming soon, who's filled with nuggets around self-awareness and mindfulness. I mean, that's the space that they spend a lot of their time in. They're, you know, very skilled in those areas because really we must inhale, exhale, and then we have to repeat it. That's how we find our rhythm and our flow. And so with that said, I'm encouraging you to try on these things. Uh, this presentation, along with the others, will be uh, on the Raleigh School website in a week or so. And I'm going to pause here and see if we have time for a couple of questions. Any questions? Angie, this yeah. is Lillian. Yeah. <laughs> there is, a, yeah, you know, I feel like I've been up and down like roller coasters and trying to do different things. And I'm sure you understand what I mean. And you burn yourself out, of course, as you try to learn and process and absorb everything that you suggested. It's almost as like, it's almost like if you become this perfect person that Angie just described, you will be successful. <laughs> but on the way there, you'll probably kill you or you know, burn yourself out or try to, you know, you'll be all over the map. So I'm thinking maybe back to bill if i can identify the right amount of customers for what i have in terms of resources then maybe i can do all the things that you recommend so there's some place here where you get some sort of balance some sort of solid number or something you're working from that mm -hmm. keeps you from going nuts with so many or too much so. balance is so important lillian it's so important that it's my word, my one word for the year. And, you know, I have to admit, I'm very highly driven. You know, I go really hard. And so I have to practice these things that I'm sharing with you. And one of the opportunities for improvement that was becoming a weakness for me, I realized at the end of last year is that I wasn't balanced enough and I was too far on the other extreme. And it started to cause some health effects for me. And so I had to shift. And that shift started with mindset. And it was coming from the core because I was uncomfortable in my heart, knowing that I wasn't eating right, I wasn't sleeping right, et cetera. So to your point, there is a balance. And part of what Bill is teaching when you think about the SWOT analysis and trying to balance that technical side of the business to the core skill side of the business it really does require balance. And that's why we have to pause. So one example I wanted to mention is when you think about Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A intentionally decided the owners to not be open on Sunday for business. 
Do you think that hurts their business? Absolutely not. They have the longest line of any fast food drive through restaurant, period. And they cost significantly more than any other fast food place that sells burgers, sandwiches, and fries. So the whole point is there's a value that they put on that such that they made a decision. And the people who work there, uh, they said, I know, right, Wally? I always want it on Sunday <laughs> and you can't get it. And you have to respect them for that. And so, yes, Lillian, there is a prescription there. And in order to get to it, you have to do the work and you're not going to be on point initially the more you do something, the better you get at it. That's why the business plan is fluid. And that's why we have to keep checking in with it and going back to it. Great point. Let me add okay. to that. One, one of the challenges that many of us have starting a business and the reason we can't get balance is because um, we approach it like we should be the only person in the business. Mm. Um, and uh, a business's bandwidth to be successful usually needs to be larger than the bandwidth of the owner of the business. Now, there was a time when that was really hard because you had to, to hire or contract whole people but there is a whole well-developed, sophisticated virtual resource industry now. And you can hire or you can procure uh, extraordinary expertise in very small increments. And so I would encourage all of you all that are doing your business plan, if your business plan has only one person in it, that you go back and rework that business plan. Um, because a business to be successful, by and large, I'll say it again, requires more bandwidth than one person has. So I'll offer that also. And Bill, I'd also like to offer, even if you're not accustomed to using virtual resources, as he was alluding to, those are wonderful. One thing that I did in my business to increase my bandwidth was I used temporary employees because I always needed extra help in my office. And Marshall Warren is on the line tonight. She was part of a temp agency and she was my go-to person. She knew what I needed. She came to my office when I first started using temp employees. So she knew what I needed. So when I got to the next person that I needed, I called her and she would always send me someone. Now, I think she gave me at least three that I kept so long, I eventually hired them. <laughs> but I wasn't sure that I could, number one, afford them full time or that they would work out in my business. Because everything you all have talked about tonight, when I started my business, I, had, I wanted a certain environment inside my office. I can get a tremendous amount of work done, but my environment has to be where I can be productive. It cannot be loud and boisterous with a whole lot of things going on. So if you work for me, you need to come in and do what's assigned. We'll take breaks and talk about what went on last night or what we're gonna do this weekend, but that's not what we're gonna do all day if you're in my office. So I had to have people working with me that understood that, that when I walked away and went back into my office and got another cup of coffee, that it wasn't time for us to socialize. And so by me using temp employees, I could keep them there a few days. And if they didn't work out, I call Marshall and I say, Marshall, this is not going to work. And she would tell them not to come back the next day. <laughs> so that's one way that some of you, when you need a little bit of extra help, you can use a temporary employee. And I have advised some of my score clients to do that. They're like, I need help. I'm like, try temp. And then you get to know yourself too. Because you may not even be able to find someone like what I was looking for. It may be there's certain things you're going to have to deal with. 
So that's one option, plus all of the online and all of the extra things that people do for a business that can help you. But as Bill said, you're going to need to be able to ramp up your business however you need to do that. I'd like to just kind of piggyback a little bit on, on uh, Dr. Angie's uh, story about when we first met, right? Because you can also tap into your network. So there's a couple of consultants on here, right? And there's several of us that actually do very similar things or ancillary work. And so last night when I reached out to, to her for some advice, it ended up, I was also like, hey, I might need help with this project. And then she was like, I might need you to come and do some speaking at this one. You know, so to the point of that individual, when we when we met, you know, that same week, you know, I like to try to pay it forward. I like to have people that I can build trust with that do similar things or ancillary things that I can reach out to. And it's like a first right of refusal. Like, hey, listen, my bandwidth is too much. I reach out to you. Your bandwidth might be too much. But sometimes nine times out of 10, somebody out there is like, yeah, I got time and I could use some cash um, or I could, you know, hone my trade or I can do this or that. Right. So. You know, Bill was talking about how much networking he did. And I think one of the things that I got from most of my networking were people that I could lean on, people that I could tap into, as well as people that would bring me in. Uh, so that's just another another avenue as well. You know, be be open, you know, um, to, to partnering. There's so much work that's to be done out there. Plenty of work. No need to be competing, you know tap into each other to help each other grow and accelerate. So we'll all be sitting on a beach in the Caribbean talking about how great it was together versus never getting there collectively, right? So. Love that, love that piece. And, and to that point, I was gonna make that point and, and lost my track. So I attended several Zooms and one of the things they talked about uh, for growing your business in today's environment, which is what we're talking about, is the ability to collaborate and partner with other people. I mean. Uh, in government now, when you think about some of these multi-million dollar contracts, there's four and five and six businesses coming together to subcontract up to one big prime, or now they're splitting it in and allowing all the subs. So that this is whole spoke hub model where it's all integrated and it's no longer company A competing against company B, it's company A, B, C, D, and E all collaborating to get this work. And so mindset change is going to be pivotal. And before I um, close this out to give back to Patty, uh, Stacy wrote in uh, a comment here around boundaries. That's not something that I had a chance to really speak on. Specifically, boundaries are so important to set. And Darlene, we haven't heard from you. I think you're still out there. I also wanted to share we asked you all last week to turn your cameras on and to make sure your usernames were um, so we could see you. Oh, it looks so wonderful. You all look so beautiful, so professional, so engaged. And, and who, who knows, Jay or I might be calling some of you up or any of us. You all have services that any of us could possibly use. So this is absolutely wonderful. Thank you for um, responding to the things that we're coaching and mentoring you to do. Darlene, do you want to talk about boundaries before we pass it to Patty? Is she still out there? Just a little bit. Yes. Um, I, I want, and this is, this is going to be maybe five minutes, not going to, not going to keep you long because I know I want to value all of your time. And that's, that's something that's about boundaries. Okay. <laughs> valuing the time that you have make sure that you do that make sure that you have on the calendar there's a stop time i don't know whether you have a time where you actually turn your phone off where you're not answering business calls where you actually do that time where you wind down where you don't take when you've put things on your calendar you don't add another thing to your calendar just because there might be a little space empty don't just fill it up just because the space is empty because you never know what might be happening before then that may run into that time and you won't have time to do all that stuff this is going to be really critical that you are making sure that you are being very uh, selfish and very protective 
of your time because see that time runs into your energy that energy runs into family that runs into do you understand what i'm saying that this is going to be it's it's not just one thing it's that ripple effect taking that little pebble drop it in the middle of the river and you see it go straight out so i want to encourage you to make sure that when you when you put up a when you do block now we do i do time blocking so when you're doing time blocking you want to make sure that of that time you are definitely putting yourself putting yourself on the list first and making sure that all of those uh, appointments that you've set, that you're keeping those appointments, but you are making sure that you are not overwhelming yourself and saying, oh yeah, I can do this. It's only gonna take me 10 minutes. When we say it's only gonna take us 10 minutes, beware. That 10 minutes can turn easily into an hour. So you wanna make sure that when you're doing what you do, that you are being very cognizant of, first of all, when uh, Dr. Angie talked about what, you, what did you write for your statement? What's the state, your, your, your vision statement, your mission statement? What are you doing? What are you, what are you supposed to be uh, focusing on? How do we focus? How do we stay focused? And then as you're building your business, when we talk, and when, when Bill talked about your, your SWOT analysis, when you're putting all these things together, you've got to build that into it. Build that into it because that's an integral part of you being successful because no one, no one can pour from an empty cup. No one can pour when you are trying to drag yourself out of bed for your yet another meeting yet another strategy session, yet another, no, you don't want to, you don't want to wake up like that. You don't want your day to go like that because you're excited about what you're doing. You know that what you have is important. It's needed. It's necessary. Else you wouldn't be doing it. So you want to do it to the best of your ability, giving everything you have. And the best way to give everything you have is to make sure that you have boundaries around what you're doing and you take it seriously because this is in a sense this is your baby what would you do with your child you don't just let your child just stay up all hours of the night and do whatever they want to do eat whatever they want to eat wear whatever they want to wear no you create boundaries for that child well this is your baby your your business is your baby and you want to take care of your baby make sure that it's it, it is its healthiest so you want to be you want to have a healthy a healthy balance, healthy business, and take care of you. And that's my time. I don't want to get. I don't want to take too much time. I'm just gonna leave it at that. I think. I think that does that help y'all? Let me see your heads. Is is that helpful? Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. I like. I like to see stuff. Okay. I see you're nodding your heads. Sounds good. That's it. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Darlene and Be Patty. We'll pass it back to you. All right. Thank you so much. I've certainly learned a lot tonight. And thank you all for the great comments. It uh, lets us know that we are giving you something that you can actually use. Wally, would you like to say something? You were going to be here just a few minutes and I see you hung on. Would you speak to us for a little bit? Oh, wow, Patty, you know, that was, uh, you put me on the, on the spot. Now, um, I, I think um, if you guys will, if you guys can read that article that I dropped, um, in the chat and the TBJ today. Um, I just think a business plan is very important, especially when you're when you're starting up. And you know, even me tonight, the reason why I hung on is because of all Bill had to add and Angie had to add and Jay. And I agree with so much of it. And I think as a bank, as a lender, sometimes I don't think of those aspects of of, of incorporating those into your business plan. Um, sometimes we're just looking at numbers and, you know, does the, does the, does the business owner what their, know what their profitability is and can they pay the loan back? That's, you know, that's, that's what the bank is worried about. But, um, you know, you have to, you have to, um, you know, think about, are you overextending yourself? Um, uh, you know, can you, can you, uh, over promise and under deliver and what what that creates with all those 
uh, factors that Angie talked about uh, in her presentation. So um, I thought it was great. Um, I love that Angie and, and Jay work together in the same industry, uh, but find a way to work together. Bankers do the same thing. I mean, if you guys think about it, you know, every banker is a little bit different. Some are better at certain industries. And so, you know, my, my industry happens to be healthcare. I usually have a lot of clients in healthcare. So if an HVAC company comes to me and wants a loan and, and I know my bank's appetite isn't that great for an HVAC company, but I know a guy at what fidelity that does, then why am I going to waste y'all's time asking you for a business plan and three years of tax returns and a, a pro forma for projections, this, that, and the other, when you guys have business to run, when I know the guy at fidelity can do it better. And you know what, you're going to remember that when I came to ask Wally, Wally didn't waste my time, you know? And so anyways, just as a little bit, I mean, it was really, it was really great tonight and uh better you might watch out for me i had to come to some more uh, just to see everybody's smiling face so thank you for letting me join yes thank you so much wally we appreciate it professor omar are you still here i thought he was still there okay so one other thing that i wanted to mention tonight is that you all submitted your videos those of you that have chosen to be part of the business plan comp grant competition, we received 21 videos. And the team is in the process of going through those videos. And we will let you know, hopefully within the next 24 hours, if you're going to advance to be one of those individuals that will actually present on October 21st. Obviously, we cannot have 21 individuals. However, every one of you that raised your hand to be in the competition, you will have a SCORE mentor. You, you, either your SCORE mentor has contacted you or they will contact you. And we want you to, if, you, if you're not part of the grant competition, that you continue to work with your SCORE mentor, work on your business plan, and come back because we will continue to provide good content throughout this program. The videos were wonderful. We are so proud of them. And as soon as we get through those, hopefully by sometime tomorrow, we will contact each one of you individually, probably by email to let you know whether you're in the competition. We will also let your SCORE mentor know because they already know that they're, if you're in the competition, they will be assisting you to put together your business plan presentation. Professor Omar, did, are you there now? Yes, I'm here. And um, uh, the funny thing personally is that, um, you know, one of the classes that I teach at Shaw Entrepreneurship Wise, um, we have just started looking at who our target market is and um you know i sit and even although i you know know uh, uh you know the gist of the material i always take i'm learning myself and so as you can see from my eyes also that i'm a grinder i, I stay up late i do a lot of work in addition to being a professor i run a, a business myself a couple businesses and so what dr errington is providing is a little balance to how I have been, you know, operating because I've, you know, came from being a, an accountant where we worked 80, maybe sometimes 90 hours a week and just grinded out until the job was accomplished. And so I'm now trying to find levels of uh, balance, you know, with, you know, children and, and other things and, and just really having a quality of life that is also um, complementary to being an entrepreneur. And so I learned from these uh, sessions as well. So I, again, like I said, I appreciate everyone um, and the information, like I, I could continue to say that this, this information is invaluable. It's something that if you guys are getting it for free and also are able to get a mentor and then, you know, for the good folks that have also sponsored and, and gave us some even more of a motivation to put uh, business plans together, you are at the right place. You are really, um, you know, like uh, Dr. Thorne has said in the past, you're really on the right path business-wise. And so I would just encourage everyone to continue to stick stick with the mission 
and stick through the classes and continue this journey. Thank you so much, Professor Omar. Does anyone else have anything? We're right up on our time, so we don't wanna keep you over. Any of the other facilitators have anything they'd like to add before we close? I'll say one more last thing. I, I think that I'll put my email address in. Again, I know last week I spoke about um, us in the next 60 to 90 days um, um, facilitating business incubation um, at the Shaw Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center. I'll put my email address again for those folks who may be interested um, in looking at, you know, um, becoming members or just be participating in some of the pro programs that we'll have coming on board in the next uh, 60 to 30 days, I'm excuse me, 90 days. All right, thank you. And I just wanna let you all know, we are so proud of you all and we feel like this program is helping us. So we certainly hope it's helping you all. Thank you so much. We're gonna go ahead and close tonight. You will be hearing from us if you raise your hand for the business plan competition, probably within the next 24 hours. And if any of you need anything, email any of us. You can always email me or any of us on the team and we will get back to you. Thank you all so much. Have a good evening and we will see you all next week. Good night. Good night. Good night.